If you have your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 11. I've changed my series. I'm going to do a summer series for you on the last week of Jesus. Jesus' last week on earth. I, I said this Wednesday night, um, if you knew you had one week left, what would you do? Just one more week. Time's ticking away. Jesus said many times over in his ministry, my time has not yet come. He left heaven. He never had a beginning. This is the omnipresent God. There is no beginning. Sometimes we pray as if we want God to change. God's never changed because he's perfect. You don't want to change from perfect, right? Right? He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when He loves, He loves with an everlasting love. And God in His design, in His plan, wanted us to have a relationship with Him. And for that to become possible, He was going to have to do something with the sin that was within us. Because that our sins separate us from a holy God. The word holy means to be separate from. And, and that's what we should be. We should be separate from our sin. But as long as we have sin, we, have, we are separated from God. So God made a way. The eternal God said, I will come to the earth. I will live in this little parentheses called time. And I will do what it takes so that my people, us human beings, can have an opportunity to know the Holy God. And God will reveal Himself to us. And aren't you glad that He still is revealing Himself to us one heart at a time? And He would speak to us and He would draw Him, him it would draw us to Himself. And if we would choose to, if we would be wise enough, we could have everything that is now existent in heaven that is the very nature of God, His joy, His peace, His love, all of those things, all of the fruits of the Spirit, all of those things emanate from the very God. And God wants to give that to us. But that last week, He said, my time is at hand. The last week He told His disciples, it's time for us to go. And I will be taken and crucified I will be killed, but he told him ahead of time, I will rise again. He lived the gospel. Now, there is so much that could be said about that last week. But just this summer, I've picked out some of the things that I think um, are highly important. Some of them are overlooked. And... They're in God's Word, so they're important to us. And I pray that we will learn from them. So if you have your Bibles in Mark chapter 11, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? We're going to begin in verse number 12. He had had the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. And it says here, now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seen from afar a, a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. Now look down in verse number 20. Now in the morning, this is the next day, as they passed by, they're leaving Bethany and they're going back into Jerusalem. They saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, uh, 
Thank you for loving us enough to send your son, the most precious thing, the gift of your son, the gift of yourself, the gift of life. We are so undeserving. For those of us that are Christians, Lord, often we're ungrateful. We take you for granted because you're always there. You're always loving. You're always kind. You're always listening. You're always seeking to bless us. Lord, I know that when we do see you face to face in heaven, that's the one thing we won't do is take you for granted because you are high and lifted up and there is no name compared to your name. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall come confess that Jesus, you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Lord, until then, help us to live up to the blood that was shed and the life that was given. Father, you are the God of truth and teach us the lessons today that you desired to share in that day for us so that we would learn the ministry of the fig tree. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Every fact of Jesus' life is important, but this is something that they blow up by the power of the Holy Spirit. They said this needs to be part of Scripture. We need to learn from it. Jesus was, had a big Palm Sunday, came back to be with friends. There they were in Bethany, stayed at the house of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and others would be there with them. Whenever Jesus was around, there was always a group of people that wanted to be close. Just simply a couple of miles out of town, and as he was going in to do ministry, to teach, to love, to share those words that needed to be shared, when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will find that most of those books have to deal with the last week. Things that happened that last week. So he was going into town and he was human. Maybe he was up praying. I don't know. Maybe he was just talking. Maybe he missed breakfast, but he was hungry. Y'all hungry? <clears throat> you know, your stomach's going to tell on you here in about the next 15, 20 minutes. And the choirs of the church will rise up and the stomachs will begin to flow. And we will start to look around and we'll say, who was that? Right? And then some of you will try everything you can to keep your stomach from growling. Can I get an amen? amen. Say, you missed a good opportunity to let it growl right then because nobody would have heard it, right? And you're thinking about lunch. Well, Jesus was hungry. And he sees a fig tree. And his mouth began to water. Hey, figs, pretty good. I mean, you just grab one, you peel it up, peels pretty quick. And you can just eat right there. Sound good? Mm, he sees it and he looks and he says, I think I will have some. You know, when God made the creation and he looked down upon it, he said, this is good. Except for coconuts. I don't ever find that in scripture. <laughs> God ever said that was good. But he goes up to it. And now uh, most of y'all know figs. You know, they have those great big leaves on it. And you have to kind of look a little bit and you have to pick up around the leaves. Now, some figs, I've got some that are small. I've got some that are big. I got some that the deer ate and make it this size and made them small. I've got some that'll grow up high. And you look around on it and you find the figs that are on it. So Jesus is looking around it and you know what he finds? Nothing. I mean, it's green. It's full of leaves. He's hungry and he's looking and he finds nothing. So he makes this statement. Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. 
Now, when Jesus speaks, the power of the Godhead takes those words. The Holy Spirit inhabits those words and makes it truth. In Genesis 1 and 2, when he said, let there be whatever the command was from God. When it was spoken, the Holy Spirit took it, put the power of God behind it, and made it happen. Now Jesus speaks a negative. Jesus speaks a cursing. And once again, the power of God took those words and immediately something happened. Now, he could have done it differently. The same power of God could have been, speak to the tree, let fruit come forth. And the next day when he walked in, you know what he would have found? Fully mature, ripened figs. Amen? Because that's who God is. But he didn't. This time he didn't speak blessing. This time he spoke cursing. Now you might want to argue with me. Say, oh, no, no, no. God can't do anything but blessing. Oh, really? God would never curse something. Really? Do you know God? If you're thinking that you can do what you want, when you want, however, and that God has to come and will just bless your mess, you can forget Him, you can ignore Him, you don't have to follow Him, you don't have to serve Him, you don't have to worship Him. You don't have to praise Him. You don't have to, to, to seek after Him. You don't have to share Him. You just do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you so please. And God will just come and bless. You're sadly mistaken. Because if you're doing whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, and you're not doing what you don't want, you're just expecting God just to do everything, really what you're doing, and I don't mean to be rude, please hear my heart here, really what's happening is you're God and not Him. And God's just being used by you. Understand that God is perfect and He is complete. He lacks nothing. And yet, He doesn't bless my junk. Praise God. What He wants is me to bring my junk to Him and repent of it. Now, why is it that this tree deceived Jesus? Because it, it had all the evidence of being a fruit-bearing tree. It had the size. It had the health of the leaves. Everything was there for it. Everything was provided for it so that it would have life. But there was no fruit. Jesus had a problem with something that looked like it should be fruit-bearing. It, but it wasn't. It should have brought forth fruit. And it, it was deceptive. Jesus had a problem with that. Jesus had a problem with people who looked a certain way, talked a certain way, acted a certain way, but yet... They had not submitted themselves unto God, and because of that, there was no fruit. Now listen, please hear this very, very well. If you are a Christian, you were created to bear the likeness of God in your life. And you can't do that, but the Holy Spirit in you can do that. 
So I need God to help me do everything. I need for him to give me the strength to hold my tongue. One Sunday not too long ago, I reached up and I was talking about, I, I, I grabbed my tongue. My wife just happened to be in here instead of in children's church. She said, who's going to want to shake your hand after you grabbed your tongue? I said, well, bless the Lord. You see all the things that I do that are wrong, and I, I'm grateful to have a wife like that. Amen? Aren't you grateful you don't have to grab the tongue? The Holy Spirit can, though. Your temper. Maybe just your giving. Maybe God has provided for you so that you can provide for another. Maybe God has blessed you so you can bless another. Maybe God has forgiven you so you can forgive another. Maybe God has loved you so you can love another. Maybe God has given peace to you so you can share that peace with another. You can take what God has given you and the Spirit can breathe life, breathe fruit. But... If you have the appearance but no fruit, it's deceptive. This last week of Jesus' life, when he was in the temple with them, there was a group of people that were coming to, to, to accuse him of this, that, and the other, trying to find some kind of a fault against them. And in Matthew 28, or excuse me, Matthew 23, Eight times Jesus said these words, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. That's what the tree was. It was a hypocrite. It looked one way, but it was false. It was not real. Eight times he gave statements to those people and he said, Beware, watch out. Woe unto you. Scribes, who should have known the Word of God, they were scribes. Pharisees, the leaders of God's people. Hypocrites. Jesus, in His last week, He knew time was coming to an end. His time of sharing, His ministry was coming to an end. And, and they were looking for God to do for them what they thought was right rather than following the truth and changing their life to that. If Jesus had changed to them, they would have followed him. But he just shared the truth of God. They didn't like that. If you're serving God because you like it, great. But he deserves your service whether you like it or not. He is God. He is the Almighty. He gives you breath. He provides everything. And if you have been wise enough to make him your Savior and Lord, and you say, I will be a follower of Christ, nowhere in it does it say, you follow as you want. A disciple follows as the master leads. In John, excuse me, yes, it's in excuse me, Luke, I'm sorry. In Luke chapter 3, at the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, they came to him to find out who uh, John would say that he was. They were looking for some kind of a, a reaction by John the Baptist. What are you doing? You're out here baptizing all these people. What are you doing? Who are you? John 3, uh, excuse me, I said, said it again. Luke 3, verse number 7, the Bible says this. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Bro of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? That's offensive. He called them a bunch of snakes. And notice the phrase here. He, he, it's, he says, it's like someone set fire to the grass, and when the, when the grass is on fire, the snakes will run to get away from the Fire and the heat. Who warned you? Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Now notice verse 8. Therefore, this is what you should do. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. 
Anybody perfect in here? No perfect people allowed inside, right? We all got junk. Anybody in here need to repent? Daily? Hourly? I mean, circumstance by circumstance, things that we do. If God is perfect and God just shows us where we've messed up, at that moment of time, we should be willing to come to him and say, you're right, I'm wrong, I change. Is that right? Or we might say, you're right, I'm, you don't understand, I might have a reason for why I'm doing what I'm doing. God doesn't want to hear that. Look what John says. He says, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now verse 9 is extremely important. Are you watching? And even now the axe is laid to the roots of the tree. Right now, the one who holds the axe in his hands has got it right there at, at, at the at the base of the tree. You know, if I'm going to cut something down, you know what I do? I, 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 I get a starting point. Then I pull back, come with it, bam. He said, it's ready. The ax is already there. Are you listening? The ax is already there. It's laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In Luke chapter 13, I believe this is what Jesus might have been thinking about when he spoke those words that last week and he looked at that fig tree and he cursed the fig tree. Peter comes in the next day and sees it and he says, it's dead from the root up. And he remembered, those are the words you spoke. How did it happen so quickly? Church, listen. God deals in time and affects eternity. We are obedient in time and it blesses our eternity. Listen to this parable of Jesus in Luke 13, verse number 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came seeking fruit on it and found none. Does that sound fairly familiar? He went to a fig tree. What do you expect to get from a fig tree? Figs. You expect fruit. Now, I've never eaten a fig leaf. I don't think I want to. But I love figs. You go and expect to get the fruit that comes from it. Verse 7. Then he said to the keepers of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Now, in, in Leviticus, it tells us that when you plant the tree, the fruit tree, for the first three years, you don't even look for fruit on it. But in the fourth year, when you find the fruit on it, it is not to be consumed for you. You take it as a gift to God. That fourth year of fruit is to be worship unto God. He said, I've, I've come looking at this tree. Three years has gone by. It should have it. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Verse 8. But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Let me work on it. Let me work on it. Let's see if we can get some fruit out of this thing. Can I have one more season? Now the fig tree would bloom in that area not just once, not just twice, but three, sometimes four times. Give me a year. I'll, I'll, I'll loosen up the soil around it. I'll fertilize it. I'll do everything that I can so that it will have the power within it. 
The fig tree is there, but, but it's the power that comes through the sap, the very essence of it. I don't know how it works. You don't know how it works. But, but when it comes up, you get all the other stuff out of the way so that all the power can come through it and make figs. He says, all right, you want another year? Fine, he says. If it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. That's an open-ended parable. Preacher, what do you mean by that? He doesn't tell us what happens the next year. One of two things could have happened. They could have taken the heed, working the soil, doing what was needed to do to help it, maybe some pruning, so that when the next season came, it would either bear fruit or it wouldn't. If it bore fruit, you know what? Amen, hallelujah, praise God. That's what, it was, that's what it was destined and given life for. But if not, cut it down. Did y'all notice that? Blessings or cursing. Here's the thing that most people miss. It depends on the timing. I'll give it a year. And none of you know where we are on the timing. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day. God wants it to begin work today. God wants us to start being obedient today. God wants us to start saying, yes, sir. But if not, there's a time coming that God's going to say enough. And when God says enough, I guess that's enough. That would sounded like enough, didn't it? <laughs> and yet eternity is affected by it. If the warning was taken by the Pharisees and the scribes, they would have changed. And by the way, it doesn't matter that you look the role. What matters is what is on the inside that's bearing its way to the outside. Christ, he knew the hope of glory. Time's ticking. I'm not going to tell you everything about my my experience with this. But I've preached this sermon before. And I watched God cut some things down. It was one of those things that it was a year to the very week. I wasn't thinking about it. I looked back on it. And when I looked back on it, it's like the Holy Spirit reminded me. Now, I'm not God, and I'm not telling you that He's going to throw the flag down and it's going to be exactly one year. God is patient, long-suffering, and kind. And for some of us, we begin this, and it's not an easy journey to obedience. We have to begin small, but we must begin. And I'm very, very grateful that God is the God of the second chance and the third chance and the eighth chance and the 682nd chance. I'm very grateful that the God is sitting in eternity and he is, he is looking at us with an eternal time of blessing and rejoicing and reaping the seeds that we've, we've planted in our vineyard. But church, I'm telling you this. This is a warning. This last week of Jesus' life, He knows He's going to the cross, but He also knows there's some people who think that they're doing just fine, but they weren't. And He doesn't want to say to anybody, depart from me. I never knew you.
And yet the Lord is just taken for granted. I'm grateful that you came today. I'm grateful that you heard what God's Word had to say today. The truth of the matter is, if we really understood the message here, this place would be packed out with multiple services and every church in this community would be packed out with multiple services and we still couldn't get everybody in. We'd be having services on many days during the week and we still couldn't get all the people in. In Sunday school this morning, Steve shared in our class a conversation that he had with someone this past week. Someone came to him and was broken. And Steve said, yeah, but I believe in God. And their, their response was, well, I believe in God, but there was no fruit in their life. At that point in time in your life, should we not be, should we not inspect our own fruit? Inspect our own obedience? And if not, let's not wait to the last hour. You're not going to get that warning. He may wait a year. He's been working on me for I've been a Christian now 51 years. I'm not there yet, but praise God, He's still working on me. But I will tell you, there's some things in my life that God has just bloomed. And I give Him all praise and glory for it. But I, I don't want to waste another moment. I don't want to waste another day. I want to live my life today as if I were already in heaven with the fullness of all the fruit of the Spirit coming forth for me. What about you?